Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our March Open Mic Night. We are joined this evening by, with uh, Linda Jones with Elements of Nature and Stephanie Young with Blue Berwyn Farm, and they're going to speak with you tonight about companion planting, interplanting, and relay cropping. Um, I'm Kim Rush Lynch, and I'm the Urban Ag Conservation Program Manager at the Prince George's Soul Conservation District, and we work with urban farms on conservation planning and also helping to connect them with other resources um, in the county and also in the state. So if we can ever be of assistance, just reach out and I'll be sure to drop my contact information in the chat box. Um, and without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Miss Linda, who's going to kick us off this evening. Okay. Good evening, everybody. And uh, welcome to Open Mic Night. We're here to just share information that will be, it should prove useful for you as you begin to start your garden farm this spring. There's a lot of um, information out there about companion planting. And if you look everywhere this time of the year, you will find many, 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 many videos, many talks, many workshops, many just documents and everything about companion planting. But what I'm going to do is to give you a tidbit of what companion planning is all about. I have a short video that I'm going to show you that I pulled off of YouTube only because it's a very comprehensive video that would explain everything that I was going to talk about in probably about 15 minutes. And then we'll take questions after that. But companion planning is one of those things that one of those practices that should you not do it on your farm, you may let me take my glasses off here. You may end up making some mistakes, having a lot of bugs, a lot of pests, a lot of just loss in your garden. So companion planting is not anything new. Mother Nature has been doing it for years. Uh, plants, some plants are just like people. They don't get along in the garden. They don't play well in the raised bed box. So um, <laughs> what we're going to show you is how you can better produce a much more beautiful crop, tastier crop, and incorporating flowers and herbs in with your garden, planting those plants that like to be together, planting those plants away from each other that don't want to be together. So you can have the food that you planted and not scraps of what you thought you were going to get in your garden or in your farm. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen. It's going to take me a second to get the video up. And then after that, we'll I'll take some questions and then we'll move on to Stephanie, who's going to talk about intercropping and how that can help you in your garden spaces and farm spaces as well. So let me see if I can share my screen and pull up the video. It's about 15 minutes. So here we go. And Miss Linda, I know that you have a uh, like a longer sort of intensive companion planning class. So if you have any of those coming up too that you wanted to share with folks, I know tonight's just kind of like an overview and we're just highlighting some things. Feel free. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, not taking too much of people's time tonight, but I can get some documents and things that I have used and when I'm going if I'm going to do another um show I mean a uh, video or workshop then I'll give you that information as well I need to pull up the video that I was going to use it's going to take me a second because it kept disappearing when I was trying to do it at first so bear with the, with me I kept saving it, but it kept just dropping off. So I don't know why. Let's see here. Like I said, it's gonna take me a second here because it just kept dropping off. I'm looking for that, that email I sent you guys which had the link, um, but for some reason it just, just wouldn't can... stay. Let me see. Just give me a second here. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Yes. This is crazy. I just had, had the thing, y'all. Sorry. <laughs> It's okay. I'll see if I can locate it too for you, Linda. Yeah, yeah, I have it. It's it's here. What it was when I tried to save it and keep it on my desktop, it kept dropping off because oh, okay. I pulled it up twice. So what I'm going to show you all is just a very. It's about 15 minutes and it's very useful. So I'm going to send you all the link to it so you can look at it again and uh, keep it as uh, a good resource because it does have some really good information in it. So this mm -hmm. this video is from a home gardener. Um, and she, I followed her for a couple of years and she has a lot of good information in this video and some other ones on other issues, but companion planning that really works is something that really works. So here we go. Linda, are you sharing anything? Uh, oh, you, I thought I, I was. Finished. No, oh, oh, go ahead and share your screen and make sure you click the share your sound button as well, just so we can hear it too. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. This thing, just bear with me. Can you all see it now? Can you hear it now? I can't hear it. I see it. I see it. Did you, you click the it? share sound? Yeah, stop sharing. And when you reshare it, Linda, there, at the very bottom, there should be a, a little box that says share sound. Yeah. Kim, let me send it to you and let you send it. OK, can you just drop it in the chat box? Yeah, it's uh, I'm sorry. It's it just, I don't know why it's doing this. No worries. Normally it, it comes straight up. So let me just, like I said, bear with me because this is a weird one. I've never had this to happen um, this way. Not a problem. Just drop it in the chat box and I can. Okay, let me, uh, let me pull it up again. Because normally it'll just stay right where it is and just pull everything up. But this time, I don't know why. Bear with me. Or if you just want to forward me the email, that's fine as well, Linda. Yeah, that's what I'm. I'm trying to pull it back up. Okay. <laughs> Out of all days, it it just. I don't know. I guess it's just trying to go to sleep too. Bear with me here. Okay, so I'm gonna forward the email to you, uh, with the link in it, and then if you could um open it. I don't know why I'm still doing this. Sure, just forward it. And if you want to talk to folks just generally about companion planning while I'm, you know, pulling it up, that would be great, Linda. Yeah, I'm going to send it to you now. Uh, and let me know if you get it. Well, it might take a few minutes. So, yeah, if you want to just... Talk about some of your combinations. I can okay. pause you. Okay, you got it? I think I do. Okay, so with companion planning, as you know, marigold is one of the, the most popular plants you can have in your garden. It has a lot of different purposes that it serves in the garden, especially around uh, things like tomatoes uh, and like the plants that you're trying to keep 
certain bugs off of. It puts nematode killing um, elements in the soil to keep those root, not nematodes, from tying up your roots or some of your plants. It gives off an awful smell. <laughs> uh, marigolds aren't the most freshest smelling plants in your garden. And that's for a good reason because they kind of help to deter a lot of plants that would be trying to get your garden. And then you have other plants like Cleome, which I didn't put in, it's not in this video, but it can help with um, home a lot of the um, the bugs that attack the leaves of plants. So it stops the cucumber beetles from eating up the leaves of the cucumbers and all those type things. But companion planting is something that you definitely need to think about and think about the different flowers and plants that you can use in your garden so that it can actually work for you. So Kim is getting this up for me. And I'm hoping that it, it comes up. Companion I, planting, does it really here work? Go. Here we the go. The answer is yes, but maybe not in the way you think it does. You may be looking for a list of what to plant next to each other to help you be successful. We're gonna talk about some of those proven companionships, but we're also going to talk about effective companion planting strategies that will help you have a healthy and beautiful garden. But if we haven't met before, my name is Angela from Growing in the Garden, and I love to share garden inspiration and helpful tips so you can be successful in your own garden. There are so many benefits to implementing companion planting principles in your garden. Some of the most obvious are fewer pests, increased beneficial wildlife and insect activity, and a beautiful garden full of a wide, diverse assortment of plants. So we're going to talk about five ways that you can implement companion planting strategies in your garden. The first thing we'll talk about is what not to plant next to each other. There are a couple of different principles at play here. First, you want to plant things that have similar light and water requirements next to each other. Plants will be happiest if they are given the correct amount of sunlight and water. Next, avoid putting crops next to each other that have similar pests. You're making it easier on the pest if you put everything that they like all in one spot. The next tip is to implement polyculture practices in your garden. So what is polyculture? Let me tell you what it's not. Polyculture is not row after row of the same vegetable. That is a monoculture. Adding a wide variety of different fruits, vegetables, herbs, and flowers to your garden will benefit your garden more than any one specific companion plant pairing ever would. Polyculture is a variety of plants in each bed or each part of your garden. Think of adding as many different types of plants to each garden bed as you can. A simple way to do this is to always try and have a vegetable, an herb, and a flower in each bed. So I began my garden journey using square foot gardening methods. That's how I got started. That's what I still do today. One of the biggest reasons why I think square foot gardening is such an effective method is that it encourages you to plant a wide variety of different crops within the same bed. There is a natural polyculture that results when you practice square foot gardening principles. On the other hand, a monoculture is so inviting to pests. It's really easy for that pest of whatever crop that is to find its intended host. So how do we implement polyculture in our garden? Here are a few different ways. Learn how different crops grow so that you can plant different crops with similar light and water requirements next to each other. Don't be afraid to add a variety of vegetables to each bed. When a spot in your garden opens up, Fill it. It's okay if it's different than what's growing around it. Add perennial herbs to your garden beds. Resist the urge to plant all of one type of vegetable in one location. Add it to different areas around your garden. Don't put all the squash in one bed. That's going to make it really easy for the squash bug to find all the squash. Learn which flowers grow well from seeds in each of your seasons and add those seeds to your garden when you plant. You will love seeing what flowers pop up next to the vegetables in your garden. Ultimately, it is the beneficial insects and pollinators that are gonna do the heavy lifting 
of pest control in your garden. We want to create an environment and a habitat for them to thrive. We want to encourage those beneficial insects to come in. They are the natural predators for the pests that we will encounter in our garden. The first step and the most important is to eliminate all use of pesticides. Just don't do it. Don't use any pesticides in your garden. Most pesticides don't discriminate between the good guys and the bad guys. And when the bad guys show up, believe me, you want the good guys there to help take care of them. You don't want to have to do it all on your own. All right, what about organic pest control methods? Be very careful. Use those with a very light hand. Observation is definitely your best tool. Be very observant about what is going on with your garden because even organic pest control methods can have unintended consequences. Here are a few of the good guys that you're looking to attract to your garden. Minute pirate bug, lacewings, parasitic wasps, praying mantids, New ride? Yep, we're cruising in style with Verizon Home Internet. Got it for just 25 bucks. Sorry about that. That's, that's speed, something I couldn't get price, out. Price, price, just... Hoverflies. They do a great job pollinating, but many of those insects, their offspring, their larvae, also help control pests. Learn to identify all stages of these beneficial insects and do everything you can to invite them into your garden. Provide diverse habitats and food sources. That means letting herbs go to flower, providing the beneficial insects with the type of nectar they like. Leave your flowering herbs and flowers in place past blooming and delay cleaning up. Practice organic gardening principles, adding organic matter, adding compost. Leave the stems of plants in place for nesting bees and other insects. Plant as many beneficial insect friendly plants as possible. Here are some of my favorite beneficial insect friendly plants. Alyssum, basil, forage, cilantro, cosmos, dill, lavender, lobelia, marigold, mint, Parsley, Queen Anne's Lace, Rudbeckia, Scabiosa, Tithonia, and Zinnia. So many of the plants on that list are really easy to grow and simple to add to your garden. Another great way to practice companion planting is to use plants as support for one another. One of the most famous instances of companion planting is the three sisters, the symbiotic relationship that exists between corn, beans, and squash when they are grown together. Those beans grow up the corn, the squash shields the soil. Plants next to each other that have different needs can help each other out. This first happened in my garden by accident. A cucumber found a nearby sunflower and happily grew up it. And I've implemented this in other areas of my garden. Plant tall plants that can provide vertical support for plants that love to climb and sprawl. Here are some of my favorite plants that love to grow nice and tall. Here are some of my favorite plants that love to climb. Plant these next to tall plants and allow them to grow vertically. Finally, use companion planting to help repel pests. It's not completely understood how the pests are repelled or attracted to certain plants, but some companionships have proven to be effective. So if you plant basil near tomatoes, they are less attractive to hornworms and thrips. Calendula next to collards helps with aphids. 
Chamomile, dill, sage, and thyme, when planted near brassicas, may help repel cabbage worms. Marigolds, when planted near brassicas and onions, may help repel onion root maggot fly and the cabbage root fly. Those companionships have been scientifically proven to work. I got those pairings from the book, Plant Partners, Science-Based Companion Planting Strategies for the Vegetable Garden. I'll link to that book here in the video. Another way to practice companion planting to help with pests is using a trap crop. The trick with using trap crops is to plant them before you plant your desired crop and to plant them around the perimeter. And when those pests show up, it's important to dispose of that crop and those insects so they don't reproduce and move on to your desired crop. Here are a few trap pairings that actually work. I will link to the studies and sources that I used for this information in the video description. For flea beetles, here are some possible trap crops. White flies, aphids, squash bugs, squash vine borer, cucumber beetle, cabbage worm, Japanese beetle, leaf-footed bugs, thrips, Colorado potato beetle, spider mites. As you begin implementing companion planting strategies in your garden, hopefully you'll see an increase in beneficial insects and pollinators, a decrease in pests, and an overall healthier garden. Thank you so much for watching. All right, so we can stop that one. So, what do you guys think? Are you doing any of that in your garden? You can come off the mic if you have a response. Is anybody using companion planting at all? Uh, hey, this is Kate. There. Uh -huh. uh, here, here at KJ Urban Farm, we, we've uh, used companion planting. We're fond of the marigold, and we use a lot of mint around the place. Mm -hmm. um, but as I'm listening to this, I think we, we're going to do more, um, as she mentioned, more more mingling. Because what mm -hmm. we, we chose to do a lot of bordering, and then we have a full row of marigolds somewhere near the tomatoes and things like that. Mm -hmm. And one thing we found out is that you cannot grow potatoes near, ras near strawberries. Mm -hmm. They don't go together. We learned that. And so, you know, we've been trying along the way, way back when we picked up some um, praying mantis and stuff like that. They're still around. But the, uh, these other beetles, these Japanese beetles and so forth, mm -hmm. it has a lot of different um, versions from, from infancy. I haven't seen a lot of them, but I've yeah. seen, I've learned to see the babies and you know what the adults look like. But mm -hmm. the kids eat a lot of food too. They do a lot of damage. So we we destroy every one of them we see. And we've been looking for the new stuff that they say that's out yet. And we, they're not sure that we've seen one yet. We thought we saw something there where it might be and we killed it. But otherwise, that's we've been trying. But from this particular video, we're going to go back and because we have a lot of the things that she mentioned mm -hmm. and sort of intertwine them with the different rows. Cause right now we still use, we use about 20. What do you think Linda? They're about 20 to 25, maybe 30 feet long yeah. rows. Yeah. And so you, that's been working for us. Good, good, good. And yeah. uh, one of the, the plants that they didn't uh, mention in there is a uh, amaranth. It's a trap plant as well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you put that in your garden, you put it out as a border around the places where right. uh, you have bug pressure heavy pest pressure and what they'll do is they'll they'll rip that thing it'll look like a cheese swiss cheese cloth by the time they're done but mm. your other product your produce that's adjacent to where that amaranth is it'll be pristine and i've mm. seen that in gardens in action um I, I haven't put a lot of amaranth in my garden near my vegetables i, I like them in the flower garden for the most part 
but I haven't had a lot of pest issues as either mm -hmm. because I do companion plant. But incorporating as many of those practices as the video outline will definitely help you to like have better produce, better looking produce, and you will not have a lot of extra work to do as far as like trying to use any type of pest. I don't use any uh, pesticides in my garden. I rely on the bugs, uh, ladybugs coming in, and all of the, the beneficials coming in and taking up root because if you if you spray to try to or put down things to try to kill off a certain insect, the good insects will probably try it out too. So you're pretty much, you know, killing off your your good friendly yeah. uh, insects. So just as much as possible, use a plant to your advantage to try to do as much elimination of possible pest issues as you possibly can. Mm. Let's see, do I have anything in the chat box here? Uh, yeah, marigolds everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. one of the that's one of that's the best true. plants you can have. If you don't have marigolds in your garden, shame on you because they're so easy to grow. And uh, this book, Plant Partners, it's a very, very good book. And there's an, also another book about carrots, love tomatoes, I believe. And mm -hmm. there are a couple others that are very uh, beneficial. And get some good resources. Uh, on YouTube, the video that I that I we passed a link along is one of the most comprehensive because some of the others kind of focus on one particular, uh, one or two particular uh, plants like tomatoes, or they may focus on one other plant. But mm -hmm. this video gives you a broad overview of pretty much all of them, except for maybe a few that, like I said, she didn't mention the the um, the amaranth, but that's a good one. But in farming, try different things to see what works because as we grow, we still don't know everything and we never will because things are always changing. And uh, it it just helps to know as much as you can possibly know. And then ask other people, what are you doing to get rid of, or, or do you have a problem with a certain pest and what are you using organically to, you know, to mitigate those issues? I went to, um, I was in a farming class last year at Eco City, the beginning farmer training class. And there was a, they had a big problem with flea beetles and it was on the eggplants, I believe. And there was, there were no trap crops, no intercropping, no anything with that. So the flea beetles were just having a, a party. They were eating up all of the leaves on the eggplants and, and attacking the eggplants themselves. But had there been a um, trap plant or companion plant in there, the, the problem would not have probably been as bad. But that's that's the biggest field I've seen with that particular problem. Mass, the whole field was full of uh, flea beetle damage. So, you know, not using monoculture is the best thing you could do because if you have a certain crop and you have a certain pest that loves that crop, they have nowhere to go except to eat that particular crop. So like with corn and whatever, you have rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of corn. Uh, the possibility of that crop being devastated by a single bug that loves that crop is pretty much, you know, it's going to happen. Plant a row of of uh, greens, uh, like the cabbage moth will tear that up if you don't cover it. So my other thing about companion planting too is some plants will do just as well without a, uh, a companion, but it has to be a certain plant, but I don't know which one that is yet because I haven't run across it. But if you don't put companion plants down before you plant your main crop, then you're going to have problems. It's almost like let, leaving a barn door open and the, you know, the, car, <laughs> the horse is gone and then you want to shut the door later. But just think of it as a precautionary type practice that you should incorporate yes. before you plant. What's up? I'm in a meeting. What's up? Oh, huh? Oh, that's somebody with a kid. But just remember, companion planting should be done like now before 
before you start putting out your grant, your um, your main crops. You can even start them from seed. Just have them somewhere. Yeah, garlic is a good companion plant. Uh, Paul had that question. It's a good companion plant. A lot of uh, bugs hate the smell of garlic, and surround your 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 precious plants with garlic and all those other things with that emit the aroma that is not pleasing to a lot of pests. Mix that up with some marigolds and put some amaranth on the border. You probably have some really beautiful plants. No bug bites or minimize the bug bites. So just practice it, incorporate it into your daily regimen as you're starting to plant for the spring because if you don't, you're going to have a lot of problems uh, from beginning to end. And you have to be throwing out a lot of stuff that you wanted to keep, but you can't sell it in the market if it's eaten up like that. Uh, you can eat it, but, you know, and just wash it and whatever. But for if you're growing to sell it and you're not selling it, you're growing it for the bugs to eat. And you definitely can take the precautions because netting is really inexpensive. Uh, the seeds are really inexpensive. Save your seeds. If you have marigolds every year, save your seeds and you never have to buy any marigolds pretty much for the rest of your farming life. And um, just do whatever you can to avoid anything that you can. So I'm going to turn this over to Stephanie, who's going to do um, a talk on uh, relay planning. Oh, gophers, somebody mentioned gophers and deers and moles. They... Uh, <laughs> They like certain things, and if you you're setting up the environment for them, they will come. Uh, they're more of a a walking pest than a flying pest, but though you know there are ways to get rid of those as well or deter those as well. So I'm going to turn the talk over to Stephanie to talk about relay and intercropping, which is another crucial thing that you can think about uh, in order trying to get your produce to market in the best shape possible. So I am going to turn this over to Stephanie. And I'm going to mute myself. All right, Stephanie, here you go. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Um, I'm Stephanie. Uh, I run Blue Berwyn Farm in Berwyn Heights. Uh, like Linda was saying, I'm going to talk about um, intercropping, which is really just another word for interplanting. I'm going to use those words interchangeably, so um, they kind of mean the same thing. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about relay planting, which is a type of intercropping. But mostly what I'm going to focus on is kind of like the farmer perspective. I found that when I switched from being a gardener into farming, some of the advice I was getting for companion planting like didn't really translate because um, I'm trying to sell all this produce to make a living. And if I'm if I'm not using my space wisely, then I can't sell enough produce to do that. So. Um, that's kind of where I am approaching the interplanting conversation is, is from the, the, like, I need to make money perspective. So let me share my presentation. Okay. Everybody can see this. Perfect. Okay. So um, my information's in the chat. So if you want to like check out the website or contact me, um, go for it. I love chatting with people about vegetables. Um, so I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to talk about interplanting, relay planting. Uh, I'm going to talk about like, why am I using these techniques on my farm? Like how does it benefit the farm? Not just um, like the ecosystem as a whole. And then I'm gonna talk about the factors that I'm thinking about when I'm deciding what plants to plant together. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the things that have worked for me, some of the things that haven't worked for me. Um, spoiler alert, one of the things that hasn't worked for me is certain types of marigold. So we'll talk about that at the very end. Um, and so I have this picture here of some edible flowers that I grew last year and I sold these. A lot of these are just interplanted things or things that just, come up on their own um, and I can make a sellable product out of them. So that's one of the, the things that I can get out of interplanting. So um, we've talked a little bit about interplanting and, and intercropping, right? That's just like planting more than two species together. 
relay planting is when you do that with like timing in mind. So if I'm gonna take, say my, um, my lettuce out of the ground, maybe I wanna plant another crop into the ground two weeks before I pull that first crop out to keep that soil covered. So like the new crop that's going in has a little bit of time to, to get bigger, take over before I pull out that first crop. Alternatively, you can plant like two crops together knowing that one of them is gonna be maturing a lot faster. The classic example is radishes and um, carrots. So like you plant the radishes and carrots, the radishes are done in like 30 seconds, you pull them out and then the carrots get big. Um, so that's, that's like a specific type of intercropping that I'm thinking about because my plot of space is a fifth of an acre. I, I don't have a lot of land. I'm trying to maximize as much as I can. Um, so obviously interplanting is great for like keeping pests out of your garden. Um, it's great for bringing in beneficials especially any flowering plant. Like if you're planting vegetables and you're not planting flowers, plant flowers, like that is my biggest thing. Like plant any flowers, um, flowers are great. Uh, but for me, I'm looking to make money. So I'm looking to try and put as many crops in a particular space as I can. And so I can do that by putting two different plants that need different requirements into the same space. I can plant them a little bit closer together than maybe I could if I was doing two of the same crop. Um, with the relay cropping, I'm saving time, right? So if there's like a two week overlap between two of my crops, that means I'm saving two weeks. Like I'm cutting off two weeks from the time that a plant has to be in the ground. We also wanna be thinking about covering our soil. So this is the soil conservation district, right? So we wanna make sure that we're preventing erosion. Um, we wanna keep all of our soil in place. And so having more roots in that soil is going to help keep that soil there. Um, it's also going to retain moisture. There's a huge um, ecosystem in the soil of fungus and bacteria, and those all have different biological requirements. And so if you have different plants in the same soil, they're providing the soil with different inputs. So you can have a, a higher diversity of fungus and bacteria in your soil just by having a diversity of plants above your soil. Um, I think, yeah. So the things that I'm considering when I'm looking to pick two things that I'm putting together or maybe more than two things is first I'm thinking about how do these things grow, right? So in that video, we saw sunflowers grow tall. So we wanna be thinking about how like if we're build, if we're putting in a field of sunflowers, they are gonna like take up a lot of sunlight and they're gonna maybe block some things out. So we wanna make sure that we're like planting those properly um, and we're interplanting them with things that can either grow up on them or um, don't mind being shaded a little bit, or maybe you're planting um, the shorter things on the Southern side. But you wanna be thinking about like, is this a bushy plant? Is it a really thin spindly plant? Uh, what do the roots do? So lettuces are a very shallow rooted plant. Um, you like look at it funny and it can tip over. Whereas like tomatoes, their roots go out like, you know, it, sometimes when I'm pulling a tomato out, it can seem like yards. They're, they're, going, they're going deep and they're going out. So um, those types of plants can be planted together really easily because they're pulling nutrients from different spheres in the soil. Um, and if you're looking for like which plants have like different uh, root depths, um, Google has amazing information. You also wanna think about days of maturity. So with like the radishes and the carrots, right? The radishes will mature really quickly. And then the carrots might take uh, two to three months depending on the variety and depending on like how well they germinated. Um, you wanna think about what plant is this family in? I'm not gonna plant my kales with my collards because they're gonna attract the same pests. Um, they're going to be contributing the same thing to the soil. And so you really want that diversity. Even if you want to plant a whole row of kale, which I do, um, then plant your collards a couple rows over. Don't plant them right next to it. Uh, and so just, just make sure that you're, you're thinking about what those different families are. The nice thing about those flowers that we've been talking about is that there are a lot of different flower families. So um, just like throwing in a flower 
can really help with that uh, biodiversity. And then you want to ask, like, is there anything funky about this plant? Like, does it inhibit the growth of other plants for vegetables? Is it going to affect the flavor of another plant? When I was looking up interplanting possibilities for garlic, I kept seeing this one thing, do not plant strawberries next to your garlic because your strawberries will taste like garbage. Um, so that's either something that you learn the hard way or um, there's a lot of information out there on like, what are the things you don't plant together? And we can see in this, um, in this like second picture here, I've got some cucumbers that are growing up these trellises. I've got nasturtiums on the bottom. In the next bed over, we've got leeks and kale are growing together. There's some like calendula kind of like speckled in there. Um, you can really grow a lot in a small space. So some of the things that I have found work for me, and keep in mind, this is going to be different for you. It depends on your soil. It depends on your irrigation. It depends on your sunlight. Um, it depends on the varieties you're planting. So you're, you're going to have to like try some things out. Kale and head lettuce is like my moneymaker. I will plant kale and lettuce at the same time. Um, my, my kales are placed at the normal spacing and I'll just like pop a lettuce in between each of them. So when you think about the spacing overall, I would never want to put kales six inches apart from each other, but the lettuces grow to full size before the kale can really sprawl out. So as the kale gets to the size where they're starting to shade the lettuces, the lettuces are already mature and I can pull them out, bring them to market. And then, you know, a few weeks later, I'm pulling out some, some of these smaller kale leaves. So that's my favorite interplanting that I've found so far. I really like doing chard and green onions as well. And you can see, I have all four of these things in this picture. Um, the chard's growing habit is not as, it doesn't spread out as much as the kale. And so it doesn't really shade the green onions. The green onions take a little bit of time. They take about three months to really reach a size where I can bring them to market. Um, but it's okay if the chard is full size right next to them, because like I said, it's not shading the green onions. Um, and so they can just like hang out there for as long as they need. The nice thing about the green onions is they also don't have to be harvested when they're exactly the right size. You can let them get a little bit bigger. You can leave them in the ground. Um, and so like they coexist perfectly well together. They're, they're best friends. I love this interplanting. I will do it for the rest of my farming life. Um, and in general, green onions are the thing that I pop into like every nook and cranny because I'm selling at a market and I'm not just like looking at my garden. I, I need something that I can sell. People will pay for green onions. They don't take up a lot of space. You can put a few here and there. Like if you have a lettuce that doesn't germinate, pop some green onions in there. You got some spots in your carrot that doesn't germinate, pop some green onions in there, um, put them everywhere. And like Linda was saying, onions do repel some insects. They don't really have a lot of pests. Um, I have found that there is a, um, like an onion maggot fly that I forget what it's called that will get into the onion sometimes. And if I have a bulbing onion, it's a problem, but for the green onions, it's not really an issue. So green onions everywhere. Okay. I also like interplanting things with my peas. So the peas don't take up the whole 30 inch bed. So I'm going to plant some lettuces. I'm going to plant some bunching tatsoi. So bunching tatsoi is um, just think of them as like little baby bok choys. So I'm going to plant those things either one row on either side or like two rows on the south side. Um, depending on the crop and depending on the season. But this is really nice because it keeps that soil covered right below the peas. Um, and, and it also, I mean, it looks really nice. Uh, bok choy and green onions. This is uh, an interplanting that I have found works if you then pair it with some head lettuce. So the bok choy and the green onions go in together and then the bok choy comes out after about two months, the green onions are still really small. So you pop a few head lettuces where all the bok choys were. They're not in the same family as the bok choy. So any pests that the bok choy may have brought in are not likely to affect the lettuces. 
And then as the lettuces mature, the green onions can finish maturing and then you can pull out that whole bed. Uh, I put radishes everywhere. So because they mature so fast, there are times when I'm, I'm thinking like, oh, I have, I have like three or four weeks. This bed doesn't have anything planned in here. What should I put in here? Radishes go there. But they also go into places where I'm transplanting some of my bulkier crops. So what I'll do is for anybody who's, who's farming and has a seeder, I'll actually go through, I'll seed my radishes and then into that seeded bed, I'll put my transplant. So in this picture, I have some tomatillos that I did last year. And by the time the tomatillos started to really like shade the bed, the radishes were coming out. Um, you can do this with similar things like tomatoes. You can do it with cucumbers. It works well with almost everything. I, I'm hard pressed to find a crop that you can't put radishes next to. Um, and for the same reason, like basil is great. Basil is, it's pretty low lying. It gets really bushy. And so it covers the soil really well for those taller plants. So if you're doing like pole beans on a trellis, you're doing tomatoes, you're doing cucumbers, basil is fantastic. Um, if you're trying to follow that like vegetable flower herb equation, your basil could be your flower and it can also be your herb because if you let it go to flower, um, the, the bees just love it. The other thing about the basil that I found, I have a small CSA and I will plant several varieties of basil because I'm planting so much of it. And the CSA members love it. They love weird vegetables. They love the variety of basils. You know, you can do some lemon basil. You can do like your regular large leaf. You can do some cinnamon basil, your Thai basils. Um, so definitely like play around with the type of basil. If you're going to a, if you're doing a CSA, you're going to direct market those customers are a lot more willing to, to like try funky things, especially if you like tell them how to use it. And then in, in general, edible flowers, put them everywhere. Um, especially any sort of low growing flowers, like the, um, like the nasturtiums are great. The violas or the pansies are great. Um, the sweet alyssum is a low lying flower. That's really good. Um, I do cut flowers on my farm. I have not really done a good job of interplanting with those cut flowers simply because like the growth habit of cut flowers is a little bit harder to interplant with. The spacing, you wanna make sure that you space them far enough apart. They grow really tall. You're usually netting a lot of those flowers. And so it's hard to figure out like what other things to plant within that bed. Um, so if you are gonna try and interplant your cut flowers, uh, that is fantastic. Come back and let me know like what works for you. Um, but definitely be thinking about like how tall does this flower really get? Cause some of them they're going to get, you know, like three, four, five, six feet tall. Um, and you want to make sure that like all of your flowers have enough space and light to really be productive. Um, and things like zinnias are super mildew prone. So you want to make sure that if you're planting zinnias with something else, maybe try not to plant it with another flower that's mildew prone. Um, so be thinking about not just the pests, but like the diseases that your plants get um, and don't put those things next to each other. Uh, I also have mushrooms. We successfully grew wine cat mushrooms a couple of years ago. You just like sprinkle the spore into your wood chips and they produce like crazy anytime it rains. They're fantastic mushrooms. Um, they came back the second year. We didn't like continue inoculating, but it was like really fun. Um, you can't really plan around outdoor planted mushrooms. It's not something where I'm like, oh, you want oyster mushrooms? Well, let me put that order in for you for two weeks from now. Um, it's more like a, a novelty fun thing. Our CSA members loved it because, you know, it's like when we have mushrooms, we have mushrooms. When we don't, they don't mind. Um, but definitely if you're doing gardening or if you just like really weird things, like try mushrooms. Uh, the, you can plant them in the, the wine cap works well in wood chips. I know you can do oyster mushrooms in straw bales. Um, there's a mushroom, I'm forgetting the name that you can do just in compost. Like it loves compost. Um, so definitely like look into that if that's something that you want to grow. Um, so the things that didn't work for me are, I have issues with carrots that are interplanted into other crops that are already established because carrots are kind of irritating when it comes to germinating. Like they want to be wet until they germinate. And that could be like seven to 14 days out. 
Um, in the heat of the summer, when I'm planting a lot of my carrots, that can be an issue given that we're using drip irrigation and I don't want to hose down my already established crops because it's already humid here. It's really wet. I don't want to give those established crops any sort of like fungal disease. Um, so we don't interplant our carrots into established crops. Um, we tried calendula and cucumbers, but the calendula is a little bit too spindly. So something like an nasturtium, something like a basil that's a little bit bushier, like that, gro that growth habit kind of works a little bit better with like a cucumber. Um, and because it was so gangly, we got a lot of weeds in that bed. So the soil wasn't covered, the weeds took over. Um, our marigolds, the varieties that we like to grow are pretty tall. Um, and so those don't work well with a lot of our vegetables because they outgrow the vegetables. So for us, we will plant our marigolds in their own beds. We'll plant them in beds kind of like near our vegetable beds, but not in with our vegetables. Um, you can also just get smaller varieties of marigolds. And garlic, for us, it's a timing issue when you're planting the garlic in the fall. Um, you know, we've tried seeding it with like dill or cilantro and those things will grow, but then the cilantro, you know, starts to go to flower and we want to leave that in, but it's time for the garlic to come out. And like, it just didn't work out for us with, with the timing when we were doing an entire bed of garlic. So if we were doing gardening, which I used to grow garlic as a gardener and I would put in like 50 plants, you could do like a row of garlic around the whole bed and then just plant whatever you want in the middle. But if I'm doing a whole bed of garlic, I haven't found a good crop to interplant in that bed. Um, we tried oyster mushrooms growing in straw on our farm and it didn't really work because you gotta keep it consistently moist. And because of our drip irrigation, we, are, we just didn't have like the infrastructure to go over there and like water the straw bales all the time. Um, and then kale with green onions. I know I said I put green onions everywhere. Here's the one place I don't put them is with kale because the green onions don't grow fast enough before the kale gets bushy. So that's kind of like a timing days to maturity like mismatch there. So that's all I have. Um, are there any questions? Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, if folks have questions, you're welcome to drop them in the chat box or uh, go ahead and uh, where you see the reactions feature at the bottom, There's you can click on that and it'll say raise hand. Um, but I think we're a small enough group tonight if people just want to shout out their questions, that's okay too. And Linda had a comment about just dedicating a short row of tall flowers, um, you know, in your farm or in your garden that may not tie up too much space but have a beneficial impact. Yeah, so like kind of putting it where like I would have put the peas or something, just putting a row kind of on like the northern side of something is really good. I like the amaranth idea, Linda, that you were talking about. Um, we sometimes we just get random amaranth seeds all around the farm. Whenever I see them, I'm like, don't kill them, leave those plants because like they do look like Swiss cheese. Um, they are fantastic as a trap crop. Ooh. And Stephanie, my question was, do you have other resources? I know like Linda in the video, you know, mentioned like carrots love tomatoes and what was the other one? Planting partners. Are there yeah, any partners. specific resources that you use? Or is yours mostly experience? Mine is, is very much experienced. So I can tell you one of the farmers that I have learned a lot from is, um, I don't remember his last name, Jesse from No-Till Growers. He does a lot of like deep diving into specific crops. He does a lot of interplanting and relay planting on his farm. So he talks about that. Um, so you can, you can find it on YouTube. It's No-Till, No-Till Growers. Um, and it, it's fantastic. So like the name says, no-till, um, he tries to focus on no-till methods. Um, and he goes around and he interviews a lot of other farmers. And I just find that he has a podcast. So if you're like out, you're like, I can't watch a YouTube video. Like just pop it in your ears and like go farm outside. Um, it's, it's fantastic. I highly recommend everything that he does. Oh, Stephanie, I have a question too. Um, 
I, I didn't see the 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 whole entirety of the the rows. Do you do you prefer to grow wider rows and smaller aisles and keep all of your crops in the middle of those aisles? Because I notice a lot of people they have the say maybe like a two foot row and then they have a one foot uh, one foot um, middle walking walking path. Do you find that it saves you a lot of space by planting smaller and smaller with smaller walking paths and large bigger uh, rows? So uh, my beds on our property are 30 inches and mm -hmm. the walkways are, they're a foot, which is like not a great mm -hmm. width. Like, honestly, if you're doing walkways, you probably want at least 18 inches. Um, my husband can't, he can't walk properly down the rows, but like, you know, he doesn't have to, it's my job. So, mm -hmm. um, I would, the 30 inch bed is a good size for me because mm -hmm. I can, I can straddle the bed and lean over the bed and work in the mm -hmm. bed that way. Or I can kneel next to the bed. Um, it's honestly the way to choose your bed with is like, mm -hmm. what is going to work ergonomically for your body? Like if you're a bigger gotcha. person, you mm -hmm. can probably get away with wider beds. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're a smaller person, you probably need smaller, um, uh, beds. Mm -hmm. I do have another yard that a neighbor has like lent to me and we're, we've like tried four foot beds. Mm -hmm. And the way that we manage that is we just sort of, we plant like half a bed and then the other half of the bed is like something else. So it's like, you treat mm -hmm. it as if, um, the bed is only two feet wide and you just like plant on either side of you. Oh, okay. um, but I cannot bed. straddle a four foot bed. Uh, I put like, sometimes I'll put a, a stone or something in the middle if I need to actually get in there to keep from, you know, stamp, stomping the, the, you know, compressing the, the soil. I just have a permanent, um, like a f one foot concrete little block or something that I can step on and get in there to stretch it out. But mm -hmm. I have seen that that intensive method where they use a smaller uh, you know, the 18 inch walking path and the, the 30, 32, 30 inch bed. So you can get all of that intensive growing inside there and not waste any space. So, yeah, I would recommend at least 18 inches for your path. Yeah. I think 18 uh -huh. inches to like two feet is probably okay. Anything more mm -hmm. than that. Personally, I feel like I'd be space. wasting right. growing space. Okay. Thank you, you Terry, that, for putting that link in there. <laughs> So you got a question, no Renee Bacchus. Any more questions for no questions. or Linda? No questions. I, I am sorry I, I missed you guys. I, I had a conflict of meetings, but I'm sure you had a great presentation. Can't wait to the um the replay. I just wanted to say to Stephanie and to Linda, interplanting is the bomb and you know it. The best <laughs> yeah. way to get things done. I mean, I have a, a community garden plot I've had for probably eight years. And the 20 by 20 in, if you look at it as it is, it's difficult to manage as it is because everybody tries to plant the entire thing. But those walking paths, let me tell you, they work for real because I measured it out and it has helped because the wood chips are in the middle that I use. And then on either side, I grow on either side. So you could walk and pick on the right or pick on the left and grow as you go. So it's it's definitely um, allowed, what was it? Um, kales, collards, those kinds of things that normally pests would come and hang out with. My onions, as, as Stephanie um, mentioned, I plant the onions directly under the kale so that it almost grows like, a, uh, it looks like the letter H. The kale, the kale is growing up and the onions are right beside it. So there's no um, holes generally. They, they don't come and eat my stuff and that's out in the open. So I just in, in, would encourage people, absolutely, interplanting is the bomb. And basil yeah. seeds are your best friends because, and in my mother's plot in New York, she was like, why are you planting so much basil? She's never had so much collards that look as healthy as they did, big, fat, and healthy. And there were no covers. There were no row covers. There was nothing. And I, I could definitely say that I've been doing this for a number of years, a uh, long time, and it has been helpful. So plant the things that you like, as long as they're not um, mint <laughs> and, and grow and go. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
And one, one last thing I wanted to say too uh, about the intercropping and, and uh, not the intercropping, companion planting. You can also get your pot, put your, your, your um, companion plant in a pot and have them throughout your garden if you don't want to dedicate your actual uh, growing space to that. So have your little, I call them metal pots or pollinator pots and just put some wildflower seeds or whatever in there and put them throughout your garden and you're not, and you can even put a little pole and put the, the container hanging off of the pole and you saving your some, some space, but your, your, um, your insects are still coming in. So, yeah. I want to follow up on what Renee said about planting her onions right next to her like collards. Um, the reason that I can't plant my green onions right next to my kale is because I'm spacing my kales really close together. So what you can interplant together is also going to depend on your spacing. So like, keep that in mind. If you're like squeezing things together, you're going to be a little bit more limited on what you can put next to each other. Okay. Any other questions or comments for Stephanie and Linda? Uh, yes, I had a um, question in regards to as far as um, on the vegetable side. Since we're talking about the inner planting, is it a good time to um, just put regular seeds in the ground right now? Like the marigold and basil and things like that? So depending on your area, um, your, your last estimated frost date probably hasn't passed yet. Um, so things like basil, I probably wouldn't put in the ground yet. Um, we will probably, we start ours inside, um, but we won't be putting those plants out until the middle of April. Um, for things like lettuce, we planted our lettuce in the ground three weeks ago. So lettuce, arugula, um kale collards your cabbages like anything that can withstand a freeze you can throw it in the, the ground right now okay one year i had some marigolds and i left them out and they were in a, a, a burlap bag so <laughs> it was stayed out all winter long so i kind of got the bag and i shook the bag on the ground and i just let it go and I came, and that was before the, you know, the first, the last frost, I would say. And I shook them out in a space where there wasn't any grass or anything. And that actually started growing. And I've had marigolds that come back from year to year, just from the seeds dropping. So it depends on sometimes your property. If you may have a few of the, uh, the zones where they're like little microclimates where it's a little warm and they could take it. So you know, it just depends. Some things will overwinter, some won't. But those marigolds that I had, I just shook the bag out on the ground. It was, it actually got wet in the inside. It was a plastic bag and I was surprised that they grew. I shook it out and I had a whole ton of marigolds that I didn't even have to plant. I just started picking them up, put them in, in pots. So it depends. So is it good, as I said, so as far as just like going with the seeds first or um, doing the stuff inside the house then taking them outside and then just planting them like that? It really depends on the what you're trying to plant. Um, some things do not wanna be transplanted. So something like a dill, don't try and plant it inside, um, just plant it directly outside. And, and something like dill or cilantro, like throw them outside now, they're happy in the cold. Um, so it, it really just depends on the plant um, and kind of where, what growing system you have, because we are trying to be very precise about where things are planted. We tend to lean more towards transplants. Um, but when I was gardening, I would just throw seeds out there. Um, so if you, if your method involves like just planting seeds outside and you're, you're happy with that, um, then something then, then this could be a good time for certain seeds um, and you could like wait a couple weeks for other seeds. Uh, Linda was saying with the marigolds, like you can gather your seeds at the end of the year 
right there. Those seeds are sitting out there all winter long. They are totally fine. They are not killed by like the negative million degrees. Um, so like if you put them in the ground now, they're going to be fine. They've withstood the whole winter. Um, but something like basil that want, it really wants some warmer temperatures, I would hold off on. Okay. Lawan has a question about fertilizer recommendations for vegetables. So I don't know if anyone on the call wants to share the kinds of fertilizers that they use. Have you gotten a soil test? That's like the farmer answer. Um, no, I haven't. Um, is it new soil? Is it old soil? Um, it's it's my old soil. It's a soil that I um made that it works really well. But I'm a beginner, so I'm just trying to get the, uh, I guess, girth. I guess we say to my to my vegetables. They're kind of small. I mean, you could go with like a, just like a general, you could go and try and find a general fertilizer, something like feather meal, um, alfalfa meal, something that's going to like slowly work its way into your soil. Um, something that might have like a, a more balanced kind of ratio of like NPK. Um, but I think without a soil test, you really don't know what your soil is lacking. Like they could be small because they're like missing a very particular nutrient. Um, maybe they have like too much of something. So that's okay. my unhelpful advice. I'm sorry. I know it's so hard for me because I don't plan to stay where I am. So I'm in bags and race sets right now. So, but when I do um, have my stable residence, I do plan to do all the soil testing beforehand so then something like a like a feather meal um or alfalfa meal like just something that's like pretty standard that's like it's not gonna the nutrients aren't just gonna wash away in the next rainstorm um something like that would be totally fine for your soil and if it's like missing a little bit of nitrogen it'll get that nitrogen from that um you can you can get those at there's a lot of like specialty garden stores. Um, you could even just ask them at the front counter, be like, what's a good general, like slow release fertilizer or like organic fertilizer? And they could probably point you in the right direction. Okay, thanks. What about um, like um, crushed eggshells? Yes. That's, that's more calcium I, I do. eggshells. I, I kind of have a blend of crushed eggshells mixed in with my soil. Um, that's been there for a while, but I don't think that that it helps for the size. Uh, well, from what I've, I've used in the past, like, like starting new vegetables or seeds and stuff, Espona has a good, uh, reliable and reputable uh, line of fertilizers. They have herbs, vegetables, all kinds of fertilizers for just about everything. So check what, if you are looking for something, just, you know, from the, the information that we've given you for us researching, um, try Espoma just to look at it, see if it's something that you can use. Because if, you, if you're over fertilizing a plant, you're not doing it any good. It's best to have it under fertilized and over fertilized because then you, you'll kill the thing. If you if you put too much on it, so sometimes it doesn't need anything. It just probably just needs water and light. So just watch your plant. Make sure it's not you know turning yellow and just falling off and things like that. If it looks pretty healthy, uh, you may not have an issue. It just might be a young plant trying to grow up. But don't over fertilize it because a lot of people kill things by too much water, too much fertilizer. And that can be the, the death of a garden, just doing too much. Sometimes Mother Nature gives it everything it needs without you really doing much. Just pay attention to the way it looks. If it looks bad or if it's, you know, just not worth saving, you may need to start over with a new plant instead of trying to give it too much fertilizer. 
right. that's just from what I experienced. <laughs> Can you uh, type out what you said, that name in the chat? Because I don't know how to spell it. Espoma? It's, it's an, it's, uh, Terry put it in there for me. Okay. It's in the chat, Espoma. E-S-P-O-M-A. Yeah, thanks, Terry, for doing all that work, finding all the links. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, you, you're you on it, Terry. I don't think that was me. <laughs> it's actually me. <laughs> that was it's you. That's Kim. <laughs> That's you. It's all good. It's all good. Terry, we'll give, that was Kim. <laughs> <laughs> she hijacked you, Terry. <laughs> but yeah, but thank you. That's but Espoma is one of the best ones that I've had. I, I've pretty much used that for just about any fertilizer needs I I have the need for, but I don't use a whole lot of different fertilizers. I just like Espoma and what it does. It works for me. So and I'll just put a plug in. Say and I'll just plug in to um Lamont, mm -hmm. once you kind of have settled on a, a space to the conservation district, we can come out and show you how to take soil mm -hmm. tests. Um, and we have someone, if you're working with urban soils with NRCS, they can kind of look at your soils and give you some good guidance. Um, we can tell you, you know, a couple of different labs where you can um, get your soil tested. We, we talk to you a little about nutrient management and your management areas in general, like how many soil, different kinds of soil tests you're going to want to, or samples you're going to want to take. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind for everyone is once you trigger $2,500 threshold of sales, you're required by law to um, get a nutrient management plan on file with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. So we can talk to you about that. And University of Maryland Extension, actually right in Esther's office, there's a nutrient management advisor that can write your plans for you. Um, but that's, you know, very critical. I mean, obviously nitrogen runoff is an issue, but even more so, I, I know a lot of folks in the state in terms of bay cleanup are really concerned about the high phosphorus levels because Phosphorus um, is one of those nutrients that kind of like sticks around for a while. So we have to be careful not to over apply our phosphorus. Um, we have about four or five more minutes. So I don't know if we have any other additional questions um, for our speakers this evening. Did we answer the question about eggshells? I feel like we didn't. I just mentioned that it, it you know, it has the calcium carries a lot of calcium whether that's about all that I would use it for or recommend it be used for but then it doesn't the eggshells don't dissolve as quickly as you would think they would they kind of just sit there you have to actually take the eggshells and put them in a blender and like yeah, liquefy them, them up yeah and then let it dry. Up. <clears throat> yeah and for all of that work you can probably just go buy some uh you know uh, organic calcium derivative or something like that but it's a I mean it's a little powder for a lot of work but it takes a while for it to actually break down so something else would probably work better but you know put it in the compost and then let it break down in a compost as a matter of fact that that's what i've been doing i've been mm -hmm. getting like all the old vegetables and fruits vegetables things like that mm -hmm. um grasses um ornamental grasses and just composting and putting there all that and just kind of turning it and just mm -hmm. the compost yeah, it works. So that's pretty much, well, to, to start the base of uh, the rest of the soil, obviously. Mm -hmm. You're just doing it that way. It's a good start. Okay. I just want to say all this is so exciting. I'm glad you're enjoying it. We're here to share. And Dan brought up a good point as well about eggshells are good to keep slugs away. Oh yeah. It helps to slice up those little bodies. <laughs> Not to get too graphic, but oh, they're squirmy. All right. Well we can, I'll stay on for a little bit longer, but I just wanted to go ahead and officially close out um, and thank Stephanie and Linda for all of their preparing background noise. Um, really appreciate your work, your presentations, and we'll follow up after this uh, with the links in the chat, as well as the overall presentation and the recording. Um, so thank you all again, and we look forward to seeing folks in April when we talk about food safety.
Have a good okay. night. Good night. All right. Thank you.